Yeah, and we're going live. I'm just going to pick at this for a minute or two. Waiting for people to get through the commercial and stuff like that at the beginning. I know there's a commercial coming on at the beginning, right? Okay, that's long enough. It's about 15, 20 seconds. Hi, everybody. Got to keep the fingers lim limber. <laughs> Here, whenever we had our storms and the power was out, I got to pick that thing up and play with it until, until I put little notches on my fingertips. It was great. Uh, sometimes getting a day without power is, is, is kind of a blessing. Hello, everybody. Hi, it's Jason with Green Country Agroforestry here. Of course, it's Wednesday night, 8.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, so it's time for another live stream, seeing as we are actually uh, able to do so tonight because we got the power back on. We got the Internet back. It was kind of fun. Hmm. And I'm running the air conditioner because it's 84 degrees in Tulsa right now. And although, what are they saying here? The, the, at the airport, they're saying it's 61% um, humidity. I'm looking at my gauge up here on the wall, and it says it's about, it's about 68. <laughs> so it's... It's a muggy out here tonight. Hi, everybody. We survived the storms. Um, it was it was pretty spectacular. If you guys have been following uh, my, my wife's channel, Mary is Tulsa Fox, she took some some, some pictures of the damage around town and uh, showed what happened to her to her trailer, the uh, the, the, the semi truck trailer that she hauled. She parked it overnight. This was Saturday night. So Saturday night, she came home, dropped off, dropped her trailer off at the Kmart parking lot like she often does. The, the old man at Kmart, the one that's now a weed farm. <laughs> Seriously, that's what they do with it now. But the parking lot is just, you know, anybody can park there. So she dropped her, her trailer off there in the parking lot, brought, brought the, the truck home, parked, and went to bed. Everything was fine. Late, late Saturday night, maybe early Sunday morning, the kids woke me up and said, Jason, Jason, there's all this is coming. And they show me this this smartphone with a picture of a, just a whole bunch of blobs moving across the map. And, and I said, okay, well, what's the purple? <laughs> and I had never seen, I had never seen a weather map that had that had purple <laughs> for the for, for the intensity of the wind speed coming on. And it was of course just straight line winds, which um you may be familiar with with how us as Oklahomans, if if we've lived here for a long time, like if we're if we're from here, from the Plains area, whenever somebody says, "Oh, it's a tornado," we go, "Okay, that's nice." Is it coming this way? No, it's a sky green. No, okay. Like, well, you're not going to get excited. No, I'm not going to get excited. It's just a tornado, <laughs> because there's something worse, and that's straight line winds. We had them up to about 114 miles an hour through the neighborhood. Uh, several miles wide path, and it just knocked down trees. It knocked over billboards. It knocked down power lines. It knocked ancient trees that I cannot get my arms around over power lines and across streets. This this picture behind me is not actually a picture that we took. It's a stock photo of a tree down across downtown because I didn't take my camera with me whenever I whenever I went to to downtown Sand Springs. But it's pretty much what I saw in downtown Sand Springs. There's actually more lights on in this in this photo there's more lights on and more uh, more roofs intact than, than i saw <laughs> but i didn't have my camera with this so i could, could, couldn't take the picture i just when i went into town i had to take this meandering route around the down power lines and the down trees and everything else they told us uh that uh our power was probably not going to be restored until sometime monday and in all likelihood it wasn't going to be restored for our entire area like getting all the power back on until probably today. That was when they estimated. But of course, we've got really good workers. They're used to doing this sort of work. So they, uh, they're they kind of like Scotty. You know, they'll give you that estimate that's, you know, how long is it really going to take? They'll give you an estimate that's that's uh, that's a lot further out than they expect for the job to be done. Usually they get done ahead of schedule too. So typically we're, we wind up being happy customers as a result. They, they tell us, okay, Wednesday maybe. All right, okay, we're, <laughs> we're going to just be prepared to be without power for a while. Um, but they got it back on um, Sunday night, so I was able to, 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 to upload the video. Or not upload the video. I'd already uploaded the video that we, we had scheduled 
for wanting to schedule for at least Sunday. I had wanted to go and shoot a little trailer segment for it and do it as a as a premiere, but uh, not having any power kind of put a kibosh on on shooting the trailer and, and, and uploading it as a premiere. I'm, I'm removing my boots and socks right now. Pardon me, guys. It's, it's, I realize I'm going to be sitting here for a minute. I may as well make myself comfortable. So we survived, and I, I, I got to think a little bit while we're sitting there without power about about you know how we how we've progressed in our preparations for things like this for power outages and maybe extended power outages what if there's you know what if there's a war what if there's an AMD? what if there's a cme what if power never comes back on you know, what if the the pso people that are supposed to go out there and repair the downline say ah to heck with it i'm gonna i'm gonna stay home and not go to work it's not worth my time or something like that what if power doesn't come back on how long could we go and what would life look like in, in, under those circumstances and generally generally I, I i like to think that we're fairly well we're fairly well prepared to to, to slide right back into the 1800s and, and be just fine there's some things that that if i think about it too hard i might realize that that, they're, that are kind of missing for example this this particular guitar here well right now it's probably mostly in tune it comes with a, a, a built-in it comes with a little built-in digital tuner so if i want to tune it up all i have to do and i have spare strings so i can replace the strings i have some fair batteries too but i just plug the string and i can look down here and the little tuner will well, i don't know if you can see it but it'll light up and it'll tell me what note i just picked isn't that neat and i can i can see here and oh it's actually in tune well that's great and I can tune up the guitar using using the built-in electronic tuner. But obviously, it's an electronic tuner. What if we lose power? What if the power never comes back? What if I can't replace these batteries? All right? Well, I can't tune it with the electronic tuner. I'd have to find some other way to, to get in tune. And I don't have perfect pitch to the point where somebody says, give me an E, and I can go, e. okay, maybe I do have a fairly good sense of pitch. But like I said, it's not perfect. And... I don't happen to have the, the little pitch pipe or a tuning fork at the moment that would allow me to match the tone and tune up musical instruments. And of course, if you're going to live without power for a while, you're probably going to want some musical instruments. You're probably going to want to have, well, what you can't see right now because we've got a green screen up, but behind me, there's a bookshelf that's just loaded with books. You're going to want stuff like this. Um, well, I realized I, I didn't have a way to tune up my instruments. If the power never came back, I couldn't tune up the instruments because I don't have... I don't have a tuner. That may not seem like a, a big thing, but uh, if you're trying to, to get through life without electricity and, and entertain yourself in whatever means you possibly can, having instruments that you can keep in tune is kind of a nice thing to have. Okay, more on that in a moment, but I wanted to jump to something real quick. Uh, really quick, saying hi to everybody in the, in, in the house. We've got Vicky coming in early on. Carolyn's with us. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> her. They're 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 very damaging. We we had lots of lots of buildings missing roofs. We did not suffer any damage right here. We didn't we didn't lose any trees. We didn't suffer any damage. Oh no, correction. Um, the corn got blown over. A lot of corn got blown over, and we staked it back up. And then I'll, I'll tell you about this. That minute. We have CC in with us. CC, stop your teasing. Oh, that's 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 <laughs> that's poison. You're not, a, you're not a member of band by any chance, are you? All right. Suzanne is with us. Happy Gardener is with us. Face K join us tonight. Uh, Diana, too, saying hello. Simmons saying yo, 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 yo. There you go. Sound like James Pergione for a second. <laughs> Lori is real coming into us from Canada. So <clears throat> let me see. Oh, Vicky said, I might want to have some musical instruments. I can't carry a tune. Well, it, it's it's nice to have tablature, sheet music, musical instruments, maybe a pitch pipe or two, spare strings, and if somebody happens to come along that actually knows how to use those things, lo and behold, you've got tools that they can use to make music. So I mean, it's, it's even if you can't use them yourself, putting them into your into your prepping supplies might not be a bad idea. Somebody may come along, they can make use of that, and that just might be the thing that gives your your, your little group the, the the joy that they need to get through the day whenever that, that event occurs. Who knows, right? Hmm. But 
some of the the sad news that I'm going to share with you right here. Um, let me pop this 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 headline up here. A rural Oklahoma family. Let me move this up here. A rural Oklahoma family allegedly hit by possible chemical attack. This story is here on KOSU, the uh, the Oklahoma State University. Uh, this is the the uh, an affiliate to the Oklahoma State University uh, radio radio show. So here we go. Local news: Rural Oklahoma allegedly hit by chemical possible chemical attack. Let's scroll this picture up so you can see what their garden looks like. Can you see that? Oh my goodness! Doesn't that look horrible? All right. So what happened? Uh, I'll read in the text here. This is Riziki Farms and Jones. That's just uh. Uh, way south of here, I think a little southwest of Oklahoma City, I think. It's, it's down in Oklahoma, Oklahoma County. So Michael Riziki believes his crop is targeted with some kind of herbicide. The chemical damage will, chemical damage will possibly lead to over $100,000 in lost revenue for the Riziki family based on estimates for the typical revenues off their subscription stores. They had a CSA, like 100 different families in their CSA where people pre-order produce. And that's a problem because... The, the crops that you're seeing there in this picture that, that I've got on your screen, that's their squash, I believe. And then over there to the right, that's their, their tomatoes. And there's that's all their squash wiped out. That's all their tomatoes wiped out. And they've already sold the produce. That's the problem. They've already sold the produce. So that has just happened recently here in, in, in Jones. And Happy Gardeners asking the question, why would someone... Why would someone do that? Why indeed? And and that this is one of, one of the things we're looking at. It's like, okay, so how in the world could this have possibly happen? Why did this happen? And a lot of people think, was that is that amino pyrolid? Is that grazon? No, that's not grazon. And the, the, the way you can tell it's not grazon, of course, is because if you look at those plants, they have grown all the way up. They've 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 they produced their, their their true leaves and got to full size, or at least mostly full size, and then they wilted down. In the case of amino pyrolid uh, poisoning, broadleaf. Uh, herbicide poisoning, they would lose their true leaves and start to, or lose their, their lose their, their their seed leaves, and begin to form their true leaves. And shortly after that, the leaves would shrivel up, and then the, the plant would stop growing after that. So this plant grew, and then it wilted down. That looks more like glyphosate uh, Roundup or that sort of thing. And uh, we're saying here about ninety percent of Riziki's crops have died since the chemical was sprayed. Uh, including nearly 2,000 tomato plants and hundreds of squash, zucchini, cucumber, and pepper plants. It's about two acres that, that was that was affected. And it was all affected. All, all, all these plants are all together in the same area. So the question now becomes, well, how did that, how in the world did that happen? And, you know, this, this the speculation is, there's, there's lots of speculation about possibly what what led to, to, to this event occurring. You know, the thought occurs to me that perhaps it may have been uh, a, a, a literal accident where, and, and this 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 will happen, especially you know if, if you're if you're if you're if you're farming on the margins, and you're trying to save a buck, and you go out and you get used equipment, you can buy used sprayer equipment, and the possibility exists that they may have got used sprayer equipment. I'm going to give myself a little dose of vitamin C. They may have got used sprayer equipment that had uh, glyphosate residue in the tank. They may have mixed it up to do a foliar feed, done the foliar feed, and then afterwards, this is what they've got. That's a possibility. It's a possibility that, that a, a, a helper or, or hand uh, or family member working on the farm, it is a family farm, may have mixed up their spray tanks and used the wrong spray tank, spray tank to do the chore. And as a result, they wound up spraying some glyphosate over that area. But it is, it is, yeah, happy gardeners say they could have mixed up their own sprayers. That, that, that was the other possibility. And if that happens, like, do you really want to say that? Because if you do, well, then it's it, it's going to be hard to get an insurance claim with the self-inflicted uh, problem. But the other possibility is somebody came in there and... And, and 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 took took a spray buggy through there. Two acres is kind of a, a large area to cover if you're going to try to go in in the dead of the night or something like that to to, to sabotage somebody's crop with. Um, 
if it was malice of forethought, um, man, that's just that's just this is it's harsh because this guy has already sold all of that produce. Uh, so uh, this Riziki Farms in Jones, Oklahoma, they've got a they, they're, they're, they're saying things about setting up a um, a GoFundMe page to help the family get through that. Share this thing again. I don't know if they've got a link here. There it is. Yeah, there's a link. There's a GoFundMe link right here. So they're they're trying to get together the funds necessary to cover what they've already set up as as, as outgoing expenses. Um, they've sold the produce already, and they have customers that need to have refunds because they're not going to be able to deliver the produce. Uh, currently, hey, 33 people have just donated. There you go. And I'll grab that link real quick and pass it on to you guys. If anybody would like to, to, to do some tithing, this might be a cause worth tithing, worth tithing to right there. So sharing that little bit of little bit of news. Well, now we'll go ahead and, and, and get rid of that screen there. Just sad stuff. And, uh, you know, hope, hope, hopefully, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to think of it. You know, if, 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 it, if it was accidental, I mean, I, I would hope that it was an accident. And, 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 and it was, it was one of those, one of those things where like maybe a day or two later, they, they'll think about it and go, Oh my goodness, we got that sprayer. Remember the one that we got from over there at the, at, at the, the, uh, the co-op that, that, that was, that was, that was used. Did anybody check and make sure that it didn't have anything in it? Oh, oh, yeah. And then, then we're looking at accident and not somebody doing something malicious. I hate to think that somebody was out there doing that, but I know it can happen. I know that can happen. Okay, Faith is saying, well, whatever he was doing, he, he did an interview. He did an interview for, for, for uh, I think it was Fox came out there and I think Channel 9, another, another, another uh, station came out to interview him. And the, the, the language he was using indicated that maybe he was having problems with someone. So um, maybe, possibly. Two acres is an awfully big overspray, though. Awfully big overspray. Awfully big. Um, and then if, if it was maybe crop dusting, maybe overspray with a crop duster, perhaps, or, or you know, mist, mist with a crop duster. But they'd have to be... They'd have to be next to somebody that's that's using glyphosate in their farming operation, and it's possible this time of year there may be some people that, are, that have have uh, winter wheat that they've they've planted that they're trying to dry. If they can get it dried in between the in between the storms, that is, because I do happen to have a small amount of wheat that's uh, that, that's that's about at that stage right now. If I was if I was growing wheat, I'd be wanting to get it dried and brought in. And a lot of people do use glyphosate. To, to dry their wheat. Anyway, so conversation st sparked up around that on, 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 a, on a couple couple pages, and uh, I think Millennial Gardener had, had, had chimed in and said, you know, you know check and make sure that the, the soil is going to be okay after that. Uh, and my thoughts on it were, well, it looks like glyphosate, and the good news there is glyphosate is going to denature inside six to nine months or so. So next year, Next year, it'll be fine. That doesn't help with this year, right? This year, they've already got the money out for, for the crops they sold that they can't deliver. Uh, but next year, it should be fine. The only other problem or issue with it is glyphosate. Uh, I don't know if it was originally marketed, but it was it was also produced and marketed as an antimicrobial agent, it's something to, to kill bacteria. And it will kill the microbiome in the soil. So all the bacteria in the soil that are necessary to transport nutrients from the soil to the plants naturally get killed off by glyphosate. But once that happens, the only way that the people who are using it can get nutrients to their plants is to spray on fertilizers and then tend the plants with chemicals from there on out. So you have to you have to get in there to restart restart the, the soil biome. Unfortunately, these days it's a lot easier to uh, to uh, to get a hold of those effective microorganisms, uh, Diana is saying gly uh, glyphosate is G L G L O Y P H O S A T E, uh, and and yeah, they use they use it to 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 dry the the grain crop. So right now, our, our winter wheat, 
and even the stuff I've got, a few of the seed heads are starting to starting to dry, and and the rest of them are they're coming ripe, they're full, and here you know right where we're at, probably about sometime this week, would be perfect to 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 cut and bring it in if we were not in the middle of a, a, a rainy period. So at the moment, I would be looking at my fields if I was growing wheat and going, okay, am I going to have enough time? to get this done, to cut it, to dry it, to bring it in so it doesn't spoil, so that it, it doesn't go too far and, and start losing grains in the field, all that other stuff. But the people who are using chemicals are, are, are just pushing that and going, we're going to condense the time. We're going to dry it all really quick by spraying it with chemical, and then, we're, then, we'll, then we'll harvest. So that's what winds up in your bread. <laughs> that's, that's what winds up in your bread. But anyway, um, yeah, glyphosate being used to, to dry the grains. So if you've got a, a fairly large operation that's growing that's growing winter wheat out there, uh, and they're using a crop duster, then it could have been an accidental overspray too. But two acres is a mighty big overspray, mighty big. And Heather has said, "Why if somebody spray fields of grass kill right now? Specific, it's a specific type of grass being winter wheat, and it's just about done right now." With, uh, with growing and ready to harvest if you can get it dry and brought in in, in enough time. Mm. Yep, yep. It is nasty stuff. It is absolutely nasty stuff. And the fact that it is, is capable uh, of destroying the microbiome is disturbing. The way it acts whenever it gets into, into us is also somewhat disturbing because remember, we have a microbiome in our, in our guts too. We have bacteria that are responsible for a lot of that exchange that takes place whenever we're trying to consume any food and do the, do the digestion. A lot of what's going on is bacteria. There's the, there's the primary action that takes place starting with the salivary glands whenever we're chewing. That's enzymes that break up food and start, 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 to, start to, to break it up. Then it goes down and gets into our stomach where it gets mixed with, with, with our stomach acid and then turned and churned and ground up and, 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 and made as, in, into as much of a liquid as possible. And from there, we go out to our to our intestines, but not everything is, is, has been ready to be made ready to be absorbed by our intestines by that process. Some of it still needs further processing before we can digest it, and that's where the bacteria in our in our intestines take over, and they take care of that re the rest of that process. Actually, an awful lot like the way, an awful lot like the way, an awful lot like uh, bacteria in soil take nutrients from the soil and exchange them for sugars with the roots of plants. There's a similar sort of symbiosis going on with the bacteria that exists in our intestines. And, and so if we wind up consuming foods that destroy that microbiome, it limits our ability to successfully process our food. And we wind up having to eat more food to get the same amount of effect, which leads to problems like having too much down here, actually. Uh, although this is, this is all beer. 100% nothing but beer because I, I, I really like beer <laughs> and I've, I've, I've managed to, I've managed to cut back severely on, on, on beer. Uh, but I do like it and I do occasionally indulge still. So it's, it's not coming off as quick as it could be. Coming off. Hmm. Yep. <clears throat> the heterodox is saying, no, not a crop. He cut it, cut it for hay. Sprayed it on Friday. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that's just, that's, he's, he's just really determined to get that hay dried and done, isn't he? Shoot. Um, uh, you know, when I was a kid, whenever we did hay cutting, you could usually get it done over the course of a week. We wouldn't do it right now. But if we wait a couple of weeks, we'll have a dry spell that'll last most of the month, usually. So yeah, wait a couple of weeks, then cut it, and you don't have no problem. And then you get another chance to do to do a, a cut and dry later on in the year. We usually get at least two cuts here here in Northeast Oklahoma, three sometimes, but weather will stop you. I mean, you, you could get three, but probably won't because of weather. Anyway. <clears throat> Long-term effects of glyphosate are not good. I mean, they, they, the way, okay, so the way it goes about, and I'm not the best person to tell you all about this because it's not my field, but I, I, I can pass, pass on what I've learned. 
is the way it, it works and, and affects the bacteria is it affects the mitochondria of the bacteria, the ability of it to, to process energy. And it does the same thing to us whenever we consume it. And so it, it, it's, 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 it's bad for us. It really is. Um, but uh, FDA approved, apparently. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. That's interesting. I don't know, Heterodox. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe he saw some weeds in there that he didn't like and figured he was going to kill it all or something. I, I don't know. Anyway. No. Uh, Here we go. Here I said, Vietnam veteran suffers from Parkinson's disease from Agent Orange. My mom's got Parkinson's. Not Agent Orange. Well, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, shoot, my, 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 my grandfather wound up dying of cancer and he never smoked. Uh, they, they suspected it's probably from, from what he breathed from, from, the, uh, from the sprayers because he was, he was a, a commercial farmer as well. Mm. My mom, went up, mom went up with Parkinson's. That's probably the way. If I live long enough, that's probably the way I'm going to go. Yay. I'll be on a twisted heap in the floor going, oh. But currently, currently the symptoms I have that are, are kind of reminiscent of it are, are occasional involuntary muscle spasms, which is, 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 is fun because I never know which muscle group is suddenly going to start doing this all of a sudden. <laughs> And usually it's just like one, just one muscle by itself, not, not like, it's not the, like, like the entire arm does this. It'll be just like this muscle here on this right there. All of a sudden it'll just like tense up. It'll become hard as a rock and it'll stay that way for hours. Like to the point where it begins to become painful. Right. And then it'll loosen up and it'll go over and it'll be something else for a while. Now, apparently we have, we have that running in the family and who knows whatever. Whatever thing led to it, excessive amounts of mercury, too many vaccinations, who knows? Mm. All right. So we covered, we covered Jones. Yes. All right. Lessons from recent streams. Here we go. I mentioned that the corn got flattened. That was Saturday night while we had the 114 hour mile an hour winds. Power went out. The power went out. The sirens were going off until they quit going off. But while the sirens were going off, we could barely hear them. I'm jumping back to, to, to Saturday night. We could barely hear them because the wind was howling so loud. And it was loud. <laughs> very, very loud. Um, I opened up the door, looked outside. Saw so, uh, redbud tree here at the front porch do this number, and said, "Nope, close the door." Came back inside. So I, I, I'm not going out there because the wind is blowing at this point now. That that like one piece of sheet metal off a roof goes flying through the air. Uh, I, I've suffered an injury from flying sheet metal, metal before. I don't want to lose my head over this, so I'm staying inside. It's not safe out there. And of course, just down the road, one of the, one of the big steel uh, supported billboards got got pushed all the way over. So potentially bits and pieces of that structure could have been flying through the air outside. Yeah. Not a safe place to be. Uh, anyway, corn got knocked down. That was Saturday night. Sunday, it was wet. I came out, looked at it, went, okay, uh, we're going to start staking it up. Uh, first, I thought we were going to be able to, to take a, a, a piece of twine and stretch it across the rows and then pull them up and, and, and to pull the twine, twine tight. I didn't really have any good place to anchor it to, and so that was not a great idea. I was like, okay, fine, we're gonna we're gonna grab sticks, and I started standing these corn stalks up and putting the sticks in. I put little sticks in the ground so it staked it in place so the corn couldn't fall over. And uh, we got maybe about half of the ones that got, got knocked over. So about half the corn got knocked over, and we got about half of those stood back up, and the other half were just dinky or damaged and didn't look like it would be worth the time to 
to do it. So already we're looking at a, a lower harvest for corn, probably about 50% reduction. But uh, today we had another round and we lost power again, but not for long. But once again, high winds, lots of loss of power and flattened corn again. So the corn is currently in silk. It was you know, in tassel a couple of days ago. It's in silk now. The silks are just popping and popping. It looks like it's it's ready to it's ready to reproduce because it probably doesn't know when the next windstorm is going to come through that knocks it down again. <laughs> but all this all this corn flattening has got me thinking. Maybe maybe the um, maybe the, the the plan that I have for how I'm planting the corn could be modified a bit. Um, it could be modified a bit. And uh, Vicky was asking if it's too late to plant more corn. It's not too late to plant more corn. Uh, it is almost time to harvest the corn that we've already got, and a few of them are a few of the, few few of the plants are, are definitely going to make it. So we're looking at maybe half of what what I planted is going to wind up wind up making it, which is still a fairly decent amount. Um, and quite frankly, some of them I do want to make sure I keep the genes to those plants because at least one of these plants. Despite the two events with, with high winds knocking corn flat, at least one of these plants, I've been looking at it, didn't get knocked over, still standing up tall, tall nice and thick stock, and it looks like it's going to produce three years and not just the usual two. So th that one, I want to save the genes from. Almost certainly, we're saving the genes from, from that one and putting, putting it into the... Uh, in, 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 into, our, into our seed mix and the rotation because we want to make sure the genes to a corn that can take 100 plus mile an hour winds, still keep on standing, produce its own fertilizer and produce three years instead of two, those genes we want to keep. So I'm not going to pull it all up and, and, and replant right now. My harvest date is probably about July 15th and by the 17th of July or maybe the 18th, I'll have the next crop in and we'll be growing the second crop. So that's that's the plan. That's the plan. Early Sasgrass said early 60-day corn can still go in. Wait a second. Yeah. So what we're growing, I could I could plant, I could turn around, tear it all up, plant more right now, and we'll get another another crop. But as it is, I've, about half of it's gonna make it. So I'll take the half harvest and then and then I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, and plant our 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 second crop. Uh during the, the latter half of July, and that will finish up around uh, August, September, October. As, so as fall is hitting, it'll finish up, and we'll be able to harvest a, a second harvest of corn. It's really interesting. Whenever you plant it later in, in the season, so, so we're going to be planting in summer, right? Whenever I plant it in summer, it shoots up so fast. It, it just shoots up like a rocket. Um, this stuff is amazing. So, the other thing that occurred to me while I was sitting here without power was, well, oh, hang on, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. I, I, I was mentioning that I, I decided that I need to change the way we're growing our corn. And the change that I'm thinking about making is going to a, a ring, a stand of corn, instead of putting it in rows. Uh, so what we'll do is on this on this uh, this this four foot wide row that ordinarily had four rows of corn in it. So four rows of corn per block. So this, this entire row is four rows, uh, four foot wide. It's 20 foot long. I can split this up into five four foot squares. Put a circle in each of this four foot squares. It goes out to the to the four foot one and plant the corn in that circle. So I can probably get around 16 plants in each one of those circles, five of those circles. So a, a couple fewer plants uh, per row than, than I was I was getting with that one foot or so spacing. But now I have an advantage because now the corn is in a, in a each, each corn plant is in a circle with other corn plants. So from top down, it looks like this, right? And we go around and we plant our Cherokee Trail of Tears black beans at the base of those corn, those corn plants. So 
as the beans grow up and they start climbing the corn, they're not going to climb just one corn plant over here. They're going to climb this corn plant and then they're going to jump over and they're going to climb this corn plant. And then they come over and jump, get on this one. And by the time they get the 10 foot or so or however tall they're going to get, because the corn gets that tall. By the time they get up there, they may have gone across two or three different corn plants. And this is each vine across two or three different corn plants are all around the circle. And that means that the next time the wind comes and it blows, it's not blowing against one corn plant in a row. It's blowing against the entire stand that are held together with those vines. And it, I don't know if it's going to be able to handle 120 mile an hour winds. But it should be able to handle some pretty decent thunderstorm quality winds and not get blown over that way. So you'll get to see me do that and try it out uh, somewhere around mid-July is when we're going to start doing that. Um, well, there you go. <laughs> we're we're ch changing it up. Um, someone's asking about insurance in the trailer. Hang on. Mary, oh, Mary, Mary joined the chat. But Mary could probably Mary will handle all the all the all, all the uh, the talk about the trailer. Um, there we go. Tashris harvesting green beans from little foot tall plants. I couldn't do that with the ducks because it's too short. The, the ducks would eat them. They won't eat they won't eat bean vines, but they will eat beans and they will eat the they will eat the leaves. So if they were that if they were that short, then I couldn't run them with the ducks. Oh, uh, I can't remember if I told you this or not, but I can't have squash with the ducks. The ducks will eat squash. But so far, they have not eaten sweet potato vines, and they haven't eaten sweet potato leaves. They demolished the squash, but they haven't touched the sweet potatoes yet. That doesn't mean that they won't. And I know I've seen them eat uh, morning glory leaves before, too. So uh, it's quite possible that they will wind up eating the sweet potatoes. But maybe if they've got a choice of other things, it's like low on their priority of things to eat. Uh, we'll just keep an eye on it and see what happens. But so far, uh, so far, it's uh, wheat is a yes for ducks. Uh, strawberry plants are a yes. I'm not sure about the fruit. Uh, violets are a yes. They will not eat the violets. Uh, corn, they don't seem to be too interested in eating the corn. They may eat it when it's young and tender, but once it's up, they, they, they won't eat it. Um, but squash plants get eaten. <laughs> squash plants get eaten. We can confirm that one. Mary got to chatting. <laughs> Were you, were you chatting live or are you chat, chatting on the CB? You never know. You can get bees, but they just look funny. There's some there 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 are there are some pretty good bush beans out there. There's a tiny little plant just produces tons of this stuff. And Vicky is saying, planting in a circle and a mound is the traditional method. It is. That is the traditional method. So turns out that uh, there, there, there may be some very good reasons for, 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 for planting that way, right? A <laughs> circle and a mound. Huh. Hmm. Oh. There he's talking about her trailer, the one that blew over. Flipped the thing right over, reefer trailer. It didn't have any. It didn't have any uh, any freight in it. But apparently there are a few others that uh, they got turned over, which is just the one that we saw. Hers. <laughs> hmm. Woohoo! No doubt, right? This is this, this. I mean, whenever I saw that, when it, whenever okay, so whenever whenever I, I I was pulling up this this this. This corn plant that had fallen over and it was starting to grow like this. You know, it's like, eh, I'm going to go ahead and pull it out, leave room for something else. And I pulled it out and I looked and I saw that it had those those aerial roots. So, you know, wouldn't it be a hoot if if if, if these these roots were, were had that same ability to, to produce that 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 slime coat that the, the nitrogen fixing bacteria can grow in? Wouldn't that be crazy? And then seconds later, I'm I'm, I'm walking up the up the uh, the row and I look down and I see the the gel glistening. <laughs> oh, oh, and we were really, I mean, I was really excited. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. 
because the cool thing about this, the, I mean, the, the really cool thing about this is that means that the germoplasm exists with all of its genetic diversity and the nitrogen fixing. You don't have to recombine it from somewhere else. It's already there. And now it's just a question of breeding out of it what you want. That's decades of trying to, 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 to make and stabilize hybrids. So <laughs> that's, that is actually pretty cool news that we have a corn that can do that and do it in, in such a short amount of time. All right. Uh, Mary is saying, wait, 1800s? <laughs> If, if we're if we're forced to go without power, yeah, we, we're we're back to 1800s, and of course that that's where I was I was headed to next with with, with my rambling, which is without power, without electricity, some things that we kind of take for granted right now, uh, you can't do right. You, you can't just get online and do a search whenever you have questions about something. And right now, it's very it's we're we're just spoiled, right? If I want to know the answer to the question, I I just go and I get on my on my favorite search engine, and I. I type in some parameters and I'm going to get a whole bunch of pages full of nonsense that I might have to flip through for a little bit before I find the information I'm actually looking for. But but eventually I'm going to find the information that I'm looking for because just so much is out there on the Internet right now. Power goes out. You can't access that. So I've got buckwheat planted in the front yard. First time I've planted buckwheat. Oh, I've planted the pink soba perennial wise buckwheat, you know, the ornamental one. Didn't really get any, any any real crop out of it. I wasn't expecting to get a crop out of it. Actually, it's just it's, it's a pretty buckwheat with pink flowers. And if it makes if it makes seeds, that's great. And if it doesn't, that's great too because the, it's pretty, and it just fills a niche. But I got the regular annual buckwheat that people grow for the for the, for the, for the cereal grain. This is the first time I've grown it. So there are things about it that I just didn't know. And uh, I was out there. And, with power out, walking around, going, okay, everything's pretty good. I'm going to go pull up some weeds, and we're going to put them over to the side, let them wilt down, and we're going to build some worm mounds and some stuff like that. Ooh, I need to tell you about worm mounds. I need to tell you about where the idea came from. It's not something I just came up with on the fly. It's something that, that, that I figured out how to do. Nature taught me a long time ago. I finally decided to show somebody else. Lucky you. Um, I was out there walking around doing that, and I, I looked and I noticed that the buckwheat that we had growing is cover crop crop has started to produce mature looking seeds. I mean, they're, they're dark, right? Some of them are brown and then some of them are dark and, and then it's, it's still got fresh white flowers on it too. So I was like, oh, okay, I don't know when I'm supposed to harvest this. It looks like some of the seeds are getting mature and it may be time for me to harvest, but I don't know. Uh, I've never grown the buckwheat before. I don't have any, you know, I don't have any, I don't have any books that tell me how to grow the buckwheat. It's, I got it in a bag full of seed in bulk and I, I don't have any directions on actually growing and harvesting this crop. And so I just have to kind of, uh, I would have to wing it, right? If the power never came on, if I was not able to consult the Oracle anymore, I would have to wing it and try to figure it out as I went. So whenever the power came back on, I went and I searched and found some university, uh, University of Ohio or something like that, website where, where, where they had detailed instructions on the growing of buckwheat and how to tell when it's time to harvest. And it turns out the buckwheat is a little bit different. Uh, it will keep on producing flowers all the way up to the point where the greatest chance to harvest the most of the of the seed has arrived. So you'll have fresh flowers on the plant at the same time that you've got fully mature, ripe, ready to ready to harvest seeds. So you have to have to keep your eyes open for that particular moment. Uh, but I wouldn't have known that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I would just, you know, kind of have to guess or find somebody who was growing buckwheat and ask them, hey, when am I supposed to do this harvest? Because simply I did not know. And that leads me to this statement, which is hard copy is king. <laughs> and <laughs> I had another reminder. Once again, hard copy is king. You have to have your your your, your information that you're going to rely upon, your reference materials you're going to rely, rely upon written down somewhere where you can access them. Where you can you know, pick them up and physically read, say your your gardening journal. If you're keeping a gardening journal, I would highly recommend keeping a gardening journal. But also all the other information that you might want to know about how to handle certain things that you don't necessarily do on a daily basis that may require a little refresher. How many cups of sugar am I supposed to add to my my, my yeast starter whenever I'm making cider? Stuff like that. <laughs> 
basic information is good to have. How-to manuals are good to have. Uh, shoot, I, I even have books on mathematics and history and other stuff, so I could effectively recreate a university if I need to. But hard copy is king. And, of course, whenever power goes out, there's another thing. We had noticed that uh, getting getting cell phone reception was almost impossible. Um, there were still cell phone, cell phone towers up, and a lot of them have have, have generator backups. So if power goes out, the cell phone towers cell phone cell, I bet talk. The cell phone towers still remain operational, but uh, they were not all operational, and as a result, there wasn't a whole lot of bandwidth. You could make some calls and data was 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 rather slow um as you can imagine mary managed to to to, to connect long enough to say jason may not be able to, to 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 get anything done sunday night because of the power outage that was about all she managed to do because of the lack of bandwidth um this brings to brings to mind uh, the, the question of okay what happens if uh if somebody decides that we need to install something like a, a central bank digital currency, right? Uh, central bank digital currency, whenever you have power outages that can knock out power to entire regions. And this is not highly unusual to have power outages in Oklahoma. I mean, it's, it's Oklahoma. <laughs> it's, it's, it's actually more unusual to have consecutive years without a power outage event than it is to, to have power outage. But this means that during these time periods, how are people supposed to con conduct commerce? If we have cash, we can do business in cash. But if we only have a digital currency, we're just sitting here going, well, like, <laughs> we can't do any commerce because there's no electrical power. There's no way to, there's no way to, 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 to use this medium of exchange that you've foisted upon us. So this is an incredibly bad idea. <laughs> You know, what happens if we wind up losing power for a more extended period of time due to, to natural events, uh, things that the sun might do, or uh, unnatural events, things that uh, may be the consequence of bad political choices? Hmm. So, other thoughts, lessons to be learned from just a brief power outage. What if the power took longer to come back up? All right. Um, Ken's saying, has to put wire up around the sweet potatoes to keep the deer from stripping the vines bare. Oh, sweet potato leaves are tasty. I like the you. Maybe not, like, nothing but. See, the, the nice thing about sweet potato leaves is they, they come out about the same time that day, daylily flowers are blooming. And daylily flowers are, they are just the best thing ever. Um, substitute them for lettuce and you'll wonder why you ever ate lettuce. But you can mix in, you can mix in your, your your sweet potato leaves at the same time. I used to grow uh, little ornamental sweet potatoes that had purple leaves, and they were nice and frilly and stuff like that. And although the the tubers that this this ornamental sweet potato produced were nothing to nothing to, to brag about, it didn't really have any tuber to speak of. The the leaves were nice and colorful, and they taste just like. Uh, a Beauregard, regular old, you know, the orange sweet potato that you usually get at the grocery store. The leaves taste exactly the same. They were just colorful. Probably with a little bit more antioxidants but because they, were, they had that red-purple color to them. Uh, anthocyanins, I think is what they call them. Right. Sasspress, and I can share the seed company if I don't mind. I mean, yeah. Experimental Farm Network, yeah. Experimental Farm Network has uh, had okay. They they don't they do not have the the corn that I have, but they do have. Well, he's getting ready. He's getting ready to, to mention it down here. Uh, they have three strains of corn with the gene for nitrogen fixing. They they are crossbreeds with Olatot from uh, from 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 southern Mexico. So what they have is is, is crossbred with Olatot. What I have has the same gene, just had it from the beginning and it wasn't speciated out. Um, and yeah, they do have a lot, a lot of really cool stuff. I, 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 I was looking around. And said, is anybody else? Does anybody else have this? Because somebody had mentioned that that Danny uh, at uh, Deep South Homestead, Homestead had bred a corn that was like that. So well, okay, that means the genes have to be here somewhere for him to to to, to breed it from. Hey, uh, quite possibly uh, I, I, that 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 
white and purple, uh, what they're calling white eagle corn may have it, possibly, because it's not far removed from uh, from big cores. Oh my goodness! Yeah, of course they're sold out. We are not sold out yet, but we're. we're, we're I think we have maybe twenty packs left. Twenty packs left. Five dollars for one hundred seeds, which is two thousand nineteen prices. Get them while supplies last. Don't worry, I have enough set aside. I'm, I, I, I can I can plant another crop. I'm not I'm not going to run out. But <laughs> we do have a few packs, left. and of course, plenty of time to to plant them and grow them. Uh, if the only thing you're ordering is seeds. I don't have this listed on 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 the website. It's, it's you know www.greencountryagroforestry.com. You go to the shop, click on shop. There's the seeds. We've got birdhouse gourd seeds up right now, and of course the big horse spotted corn seed up right now. All right. Um, if you order nothing but seeds, oh, I can't reach reach behind here and grab it. But I, I got a bunch of bubble mailers in bulk to ship seeds with, which means that you don't have to pay the full ten dollars shipping. Well, you will at checkout, but I'll refund the difference to you. So after I go and, and take care of the, uh, the, the the business at the post office, uh, I'll come back in. I don't, I, there's no, no extra charge for me to issue a refund. So it won't cost the full $10 shipping. And I refund the difference. Uh, Brian Penrody can, can, can vouch for this. He, he already got that particular treatment because the only thing he ordered from me was seeds. Um, there were some people earlier on before I uh, learned that I had the ability to, to give refunds that, that ordered nothing but seeds. And, 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 and I was like, eh, I'm charging you $10 for shipping. And the only thing you're getting is one packet of seeds. I feel horrible about this, but I didn't know how to do a refund. Now I do. So do not worry about the shipping cost. It will be only what it costs to ship. Um, let's see. And we'll have some other fun, fun stuff coming up. Uh, we're growing Lufa Gourd right now, uh, which is kind of fun. Uh, we're going to have, I'm going to keep on saying uh over and over again. Over again. Uh, we're growing Lufa Gourd right now. We're going to collect the seeds from that one. Uh, we've got some some Seminole pumpkins that we're growing that I may collect seeds from. We'll see. They're, these things are huge. They're just massive leaves coming off on this thing. The vines are taking off across the yard. It looks, it looks like a it looks like a like 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 a squash that will take over the world if it's given the chance. All right. Copies, CBDCs. Corn, the way we're gonna grow corn. And oh yes, I was gonna tell you about how I came up with the idea for worm pile composting, as we're coming up on eight minutes from from, from one hour in. Uh, I told you earlier that the idea that, that, that I presented, um, let, me get a, let me get a link real quick here. Because why not? Content. This is one here. Weeds to worms, is that was what I titled this thing. I'm just going to take this link and drop it here. Okay, so this is the link to Weeds to Worms. This is this is the the video that I almost did not get to post on Sunday, uh, and and I it's it's about 20 minutes long, and it's 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 two parts, two parts. One 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 covers what is a weed. And I thought about really doing it, doing a funny man on the street interview series, like what is a weed? And you actually go around and interview people and get people to talk about what they think a weed is, because it would be it'd be, you know, tapping into the into that thing. Um, <laughs> it'd be satire. right? What is a weed? But I cover, you know, th weeds are these things that you don't intend, intend to be growing, but they wind up growing there anyway. Right. Because nature has to have something growing. And I cover instead of. Instead, instead of fighting these weeds that nature puts down there, why not pick something that's going to grow in that niche that will be of use to, to me or to you if it's your garden? And for me, a ground cover that's of use to me, uh, incredibly, is clover because I can cut it back. It produces nitrogen, 
whenever I cut it back, because clover has this weird habit, whenever it's cut, it doesn't like to grow too much beyond the point where it's cut. So I could train it. Um, I could train it, fertilize the other things in, in the garden plot that I wanted to fertilize. And whenever I need to get rid of it, I, mean, I, I can pull it out just like I pull out the weeds I'm already pulling out, right? And, and compost it down and, and use it as, as worm food. All right. The other part of it, of course, was the technique for capturing wild worms. And I've done this technique for capturing wild worms in another video before. It's in the uh, it's in the uh, the the fertilizer free fertilizer fer I can't talk the free fertilizer workshop playlist uh, as an introduction to vermicomposting. How to actually go about capturing worms. It provided, of course, that where you're at has native or nativized worms to begin with. How to go about capturing those so you can start up your, your, your worm in. And it's exactly what I did to start up the, the worm in that we have uh, under the carport. And, of course, I, I repeated the same technique this spring and showed you the results in that video that I just put the link up for. Now, the way I came up with this technique, which I'm calling worm pile composting, right? The way I came up with this technique was, was, was simply by watching nature. When I was young, about seven, eight years old or so, we lived beside Hakey Creek, um, just a little bit south of Tulsa, west, northwest of Broken Arrow, north of Bixby, in in, in the country, which is uh, this place was my my grandfather's old farm, and the creek runs right alongside the farm, and the creeks are a great place to go fishing. I mean, this was I love fishing, absolutely love it. There's woods right there beside the creek. And the woods is pretty much un untended. So the water goes through here and occasionally it makes a different diversion and jumps to, to another spot, cuts a new channel, trees fall over. There's all kinds of snags and, and switchbacks and everything else in there. It's a mess. But as a result of it being just wild and woolly, whenever storm damage occurs, things like there's cottonwoods in there and there's, uh, there's some, some, some loose native pecan and a few other things whenever these limbs get knocked down on the ground they lay there and then the storms come along they capture all of the the dead grass and the leaves and the bits of bark and the other stuff and they wash it down towards the creek and when they hit those branches laying across the ground just like that that tree trunk lying on the street behind me whenever the water is rushing along and carrying that debris with it and it hits that branch it traps the debris right there where the branch is the water keeps on going, goes out on down to the creek, everything's fine. But all the leaves, all the, the dead grass, all the little bits of bark and little twigs and other things get trapped right where that branch is, and it creates a pile. Now we've got a pile of organic matter saturated with water under shade. <laughs> and this is what nature set up. So whenever I wanted to go fishing and I wanted to get some night crawlers, because nice, lively night crawlers are some of the best bait you can get you that on your hip, toss it out there, fish goes, bam, you've got a fish on, like almost instantly, because they, they, they look at those as, oof, dinner bell has been rung. You want to find these worms, the best way to do it is to go out there to those piles with a stick, because sometimes things other than worms are in there, if you know what I mean. Uh, scorpions, centipedes, possibly a snake, you never know. And you use the use the, the your stick to move that debris out of the way. And rake that debris out of the way. And as long as there's enough moisture in the bottom of the pile, as long as it's a deep enough pile, even during the middle of the summer, there's going to be enough moisture toward, towards the bottom of it that the worms are, have been busy and active working at, at decomposing and breaking down all that material. So I raked off that stuff, and, and I'm finding, you know, night crawlers, but yay long or so, on a regular basis, grab them, throw them in the tin. So I've got enough, you know, a dozen or so, I'm ready to go fishing. And I did this so, so many times that I, I didn't even really think about it too much. It's like, I want worms. This is where I go. But uh, I didn't have a space like that nearby <laughs> whenever, whenever I went to go to set this place up. And I was just barely beginning to set this, this, this garden up as a forest garden. And until you actually have trees around to provide that shade, it's hard to, to get this large population of, of native worms. But now that I have the forest set up and we're, we're building the forest, I've, I've brought in extra worms. They're in the ground. They're all over under the trees, just, just waiting. So whenever I do these things, whenever I pile up the, the organic matter really, really thick. And it has to be thick. It has to be thick. And we're talking at least a foot or so high of organic matter. At least a foot. Whenever you pile it up, 
get it wet, keep it shaded, the worms come. And then after about a month or two, they've, they've turned it into worm casting and more baby worms, and they're ready to move on out into your into your garden to keep on working. Vicky's asking, you done good with catching worms. How many slugs and snails got involved? Uh, not a whole lot of slugs and snails, but the uh, you'll, you'll you'll see isopods and centipedes in large numbers in those in those worm piles. So it'll it'll draw in the isopods. Those are the wood lice, the roly poly. Some people call them the little. Uh, I, I believe they're called slaters down under, which is a strange name for them. But hey, uh, the little tiny they're crustaceans. They're related to shrimp, but I don't think they taste like that. I I've used them as fish bait before, but they're so small. About the only thing you catch with them is perch. You just put those one on a little tiny hook and you just drop it out there. You get a perch. So you take the perch, rig the perch up, and you can catch something bigger with the perch. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't think they're they're all that great to eat. Um, the ducks seem to like them. So the ducks eat those. The ducks eat the worms. And I, you, you, I, I can set these piles up and then turn the ducks loose. And the ducks will go over there and go, ooh, fresh protein. And they'll tear them down spread the worm castings, eat the worms, and, and, and the circle of life continues, right? There you go. Sassgrass says, I'm thinking about trenching all around my new garden bed. Fill those trenches with wood chips. It's a great idea. I did it. Uh, observations that I've made after doing it. If you'd like to see the video where I did it, it's called, um, what is that one called? Water for Every Garden. Kind of a take on uh, PA Yeoman's Water for Every Farm. Uh, the thing that I found out after doing this is uh, keep an eye on your soil substrate whenever you're digging the trenches and have a plan for what you're going to do with it because you don't want to put too much of that substrate on the soil surface. Otherwise, you wind up with, well, too much substrate on your soil surface and you have to get busy making it into soil, which is what I did uh, over there where I said, you know, this, this, this area of the yard is dead because it was two things. I put the ducks on it for way too long and they've all packed everything down and just ate everything and then also there was a bunch of, of clay and substrate in that in that area that I, I turned up there so in between those those two things I, I had to do some soil rehab so now if I was telling somebody about about how to set up your your your, your uh, irrigation in walkway using wood chips as as, as a medium to, to, to soak and hold moisture is to only dig down to the depth of your of your topsoil maybe maybe just shave a little bit of the of the substrate off at that point and that is a roach crawling across my, my camera how nasty anyway <laughs> maybe just a little tiny bit of your substrate whether that's sand or clay or whatever it happens to be but you don't want to turn too much of that up over onto the the, the garden beds and that's this is the way you do it you take the area that you're that you want to garden bed how, how wide do you want your garden bed? Three foot? Four foot? Okay, you take that area. Now you're going to have a walkway right next to that. How wide is that going to be? Two foot? Three foot? Okay, measure that out. You know where your row is going to be. You know where your walkway is going to be. You know where your row is going to be over here. Just put some lines out on the ground. You, you, you can do that with, with, with twine. Very simple. A couple of sticks and twine. And then take your shovel and go straight along the line and go down however deep you can where you're still getting some topsoil. And you take that and you turn it over into the, the bed on either side. And now you're left with a sunken area and an elevated garden bed. You know, when I'll go through there and pick the weeds out and stuff like that, plant something to take the place of the weeds because nature wants the soil covered. Something's going to grow there. Once you've done that, you've got a, a, a trench. It may not be a deep trench. It could be a shallow trench initially. Fill that up with the wood chips. It could be it could be wood chips. It could also be leaves. It could be it could be dry dry brush material that you've got lying around if you need to do some cleanup. I mean, it does not necessarily have to be wood chips out of a wood chipper. You could be, if you're looking at that, that, that picture behind me, it could be that you just went went down that tree and knocked off all, 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 all the leafy stuff, just chopped that up and threw the leafy stuff into the walkway. There you go. I mean, I actually did that in one spot. I've, I've got all the leaves from a, from a Bradford pear tree that didn't get hauled off and carried away to the uh, to the, uh, the tub grinder at, at, the, at the green wayside. I mean, all the debris from that went into our walkways because it was, it was there. I mean, you could either load it, have somebody load it up on, on, on a trailer and haul it to the Greenway site 
where we go and pick it up and bring it back here, or we could just take it and throw it into the walkways as it was. So that's what we did. We, we took all, all the all the, the leafy debris from the uh, the Bradford pear tree by the church. We put that into our walkways. Anyway. Sasperos is saying, oh, would you use the soil for the trenches of mounds on top of the wood chips and cover crop them? Well, I have black dirt down there. <laughs> That's nice. A little bit further down, down, down the river here, where, where, where Granddad's farm was, we have black dirt down to six feet and probably deeper, but I only dug down to six. Absolutely terrific stuff. Absolutely terrific. You can grow anything in it. And he did that by um, by harvesting the fertility out of a pond. So he set up a, a one and a half, somewhere between one and a half and two acres uh, pond for the primary irrigation. It was fed by a smaller pond, passed through a grove of cottonwoods, and that was fed by another smaller pond, shallow pond above that. So we had uh, a shallow area for, for for crustaceans and feeder fish, minnows and little things. And then down here, another pond, which was smaller fish once again. And all of that outflowed into the larger pond at this point, which was about one and a half to two acres and deep. Very, very deep. The irrigation pipes were about eight inches in diameter, somewhere around there. And they went in close to the bottom of where of where this very deep pond is so so they actually went down so they went down at an angle to get to the bottom which meant that all the sludge all the sediment all the muck all that stuff that accumulates whenever you have a large body of water the water rises and falls there's there's aquatic plants that get, get moved in there's that the, the, the get established they, they they grow they die algae grows algae dies things settle to the bottom fish come in eat other fish they make fish waste all that stuff Sediment accumulates at the bottom. Leaves blow in. They get settled down, settled down to the bottom. They decompose. All that sediment at the bottom. Whenever he opens that up, boom. There's a bit of a hesitation for a moment here, right? As everything starts to go through the pipes. And occasionally, yeah, you'd have to take something and run it up there to knock a blockage loose. But once you do, kaboosh. And this jet of mud comes flying out and that mud is hyper fertile soil and you do that you do that during during, during the off season so you're not putting anaerobic muck directly on the the, the land you're getting ready to grow you do that end of season poosh, flush it out now you've got all winter to build build build, build your, your your water level back up because winter is also also typically a season where we get uh, precipitation well dead of winter it gets dry Poof, knock all that stuff out. Build your build your water level back up in the pond, and then during the summer, after you've gone after he's gone around with his tractor and he spread all that muck out across the field, then he uses the water to, to, to irrigate the crops with. But that way, since he was he was releasing once or twice a year all the muck from the bottom of the ponds out to where where the crops were being grown, he was building soil and he built a lot of soil. And you can do the same thing. You can do it on any scale, really. Um, but he was doing it on, on a fairly large, a fairly large scale, about forty acres at a time. Um, let me say, talking about digging trenches, getting old. Oh, here we go. Sasquatch talking about waffle guards. These are fun. Oh, yeah, Rocks. <laughs> it's the Ozarks. You're going to get rocks. You're going to get lots of rocks. Lots and lots of rocks. Which, whenever I was there, I did not appreciate. I have learned to appreciate rocks. Because we don't have any. And as it turns out, rocks are actually a resource. And if you don't have rocks, you have to find some way to, to get rocks. <laughs> but if you have rocky soil to begin with, you automatically have the rocks. They're right there. Uh, There you go. Mother Nasa said, here's some weeds. 
<laughs> okay, so for, for, for weeds, you didn't get a bad mix. Okay, ragweed is not great. I, I, I don't like it. The ducks don't like it. But it's pretty easy to grab and drag out. Um, it's, at least it establishes a, a fairly a fairly sizable you know central central stock that you can grab a hold of and get it in its in its in its root system out. So they're they're easier to pull than some things. And you try to pull Bermuda grass; it's almost impossible to get rid of that way. Dock, not too bad of a of a plant to have. It's a potter, lots of uh, lots of iron. It's not quite as good as as, as a perennial cabbage or, or you know, perennial rocket cabbage or brassica, but he cooks up with some some duck eggs pretty handily. And then lamb's quarters, of course, is pretty good as a potter. As long as you cook it, it gets rid of the oxalic acid. So, yeah, it's weeds, but they're weeds you can live with at least. And I think that's the important thing. Is like, if we get if if we get weeds we can live with, if they do something useful for us and they're not just troublesome and in the way, are they really weeds? I mean, I, they they are kind of because we do have to manage them, but uh, the management provides us with a harvest, and that's 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 kind of that's kind of what I'm, I'm trying to get to. Is whenever whenever I've got something growing, that something is something that is, is a benefit and of use. Either I figure out what 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 its use is, and I, I I adapt myself to that to that use, or I figure out what niche is being filled, and find something that I can fill that niche with that will be of use. All right. Lamb's quarters is a great animal feed. I haven't eaten the seeds yet. I'll, 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 I'll try it. I've, I've fed the seeds to the ducks. I haven't eaten them, eaten them myself. We've got a lot of stuff like that that just makes good food, good good food for the ducks. And even if we don't want to eat it, there's an animal that will. Uh, ducks don't eat poison ivy and they don't eat ragweed. I mean, if we had goats, they would eat poison ivy and ragweed. They eat ragweed. Can't remember really seeing any in the pasture, so I guess they do. <laughs> Maybe I don't. I don't recall if they ever ate ragweed or not. These and muck from Grandma's pool in the most strawberry patch. There you go. Hey, Doctor saying ragweed is impossible to pull right now. Really? I don't know. Oh, because oh, because you haven't had any rain. Yeah, if your grounds if your grounds turn to a rock, you can't get it out. That's that's for sure. You can't get anything out if your grounds turn to a rock. Yeah. Well, there you go. Professor George Washington Carver advised the former slave sharecroppers use swamp muck and any manure they could to fertilize their land. That was a very smart man. Isn't it? He also loved peanuts. I've got a dozen peanut plants growing right now. Right there on the north side of the house. I'm thinking about planting some more on the uh, on the east side because I, I went through there and you didn't really see it in the uh, weeds to worms video. I, I, I took some video over there and decided not to use it, but I, I weeded that area and got got worm piles set up over there. That's under the shade of the uh, of the pecan tree. But now I've got entire aisles of bare ground just sort of meandering around. There's here's a little plant of interest here. Here's a sunflower. Here's a castor bean. Here's a, a Jerusalem artichoke. Here's a canna. Here's a here's here, here's a, here's a sweet potato. Uh, so stuff like that's so just scattered around all around underneath the country. No, I might have some spots here where I can put some more. I can put some more more peanuts. They're kind of in that semi shade area and. Oddly enough, peanuts will grow in semi-shaded areas with dappled shade, with, with with partial sun underneath trees. Because as it turns out, peanuts are a jungle plant. That's where they came from originally. So all, all you're doing whenever you put them into, into a, a, a mixed woodland environment is returning them back to their, 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 their natural environment. Uh, although not all uh, strains of peanuts that we, we grow up here in uh, the northern hemisphere 
will necessarily take well to being grown in the woods. But uh, plant a bunch of seeds, see what comes up, save the ones that, that do well. And before too awful long, as long as you have enough of the, uh, the proper genetics in the, your initial germaplasm, you'll be able to, to, to land race a variety of peanut that will grow in your, in your shaded woodlands. Yay. Provided that the gophers don't eat them all. <laughs> which, is, which is oddly, but that's, that's the problem we're having. Um, I managed to get the seeds, managed to replant them, and gophers come along and just chomp on them. All right. Hugo Homestead popping in to say hello. Yeah. You, yeah, you can always chop it. You can always chop it, uh, chop it down, wilt it, wet it down, feed it to worms. Use it as, use, use it as, use it for a biomass producer, if nothing else. And yeah, whatever you got to do to keep it moist. Send some rain your way if we could. You're more than welcome to have ours. <laughs> I know, I know. We're going to need it here in another week or two, but uh, right now we don't need it anymore. So there's a book called Weeds and What They Tell. How to tell what the plants growing on our land tells about the soil conditions. That, that, that's that's good information, as Vicky is saying right now. So Tom Sokovia has done a series of videos about indicators, pest, pest species as indicators, or species as indicators, and what, what different weeds are as indicators, like dandelions show us what, what do aphids tell us, stuff like that. Cool stuff. Very cool stuff. Those are, those, th those are actually my favorite videos that he does, because it's like, ooh, when I was a kid, right, and I'm out there fishing, because I love to go fishing, just like my granddad, he would rather be fishing than farming in all actuality, but I'd be out there fishing looking at the water and looking at how the wind moved on the water and I'd be looking as much into below the surface of the water as I could because usually it's murky and you can't see very much but you can see based upon uh, based upon the way the water moves where there are things underneath the water that are causing obstruction and making the, the, the ripples the waves propagate differently because there's different depths so whenever you see a change in depth if there's enough wave action you can tell where there's a change in depth. You can also tell by, 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 by the light, shade, coloration, and stuff like that. Um, but I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could develop the ability to read what's going on below the surface of the soil the way a good fisherman can read what's going on below the surface of the water? And that's kind of what those uh, those videos that Stefan does. And, of course, a book like Weeds and What They Tell can do for you. They can provide, provide you with that sort of information. So you can walk out to a pasture, right? And look at it and go, okay, uh, I see you've got a lot of Canadian thistle. I see you've got a lot of, a lot of that red-rooted pigweed out there. Um, I see cow patties. You've been, you've, you've been keeping cattle on this land, I can tell. And you've been keeping too many on the, too many cattle on this, land, on this land. How many acres is this? It's 12 acres. Okay, it's 12 acres. How many cattle do you have? Well, I've got five. Okay, well, there you go. You should have three. <laughs> you've got almost twice the number of cattle on the land that you should have uh, to, to be able to graze them on the land, the land not have a problem with these with these quote weeds what they're doing is trying to break up the compaction of the soil that you had for having too much stock grazing on at one time just lower the stock move them on a little bit more frequently and you don't have that many problems once the soil is fixed there's not much of a reason for those weeds to be there all right So you're in the middle. Big snows went north and south. Missed you. Still in it with the rain, but not the Canadian smoke haze. We didn't get any Canadian smoke haze, but we got smoke haze coming from all the burn piles that are going on right now. From all the all the down trees. Not all of them were, were fresh and green. There's quite a few dead ones out there, too. Mm. See, anyways... Oh, thank you, Mary. Give us a give us a place where you can find that. Is that a? I'm not on YouTube right now. I, I can't follow that link right now. <laughs> All right. 
I will go check that one out here in a bit. Ron, reminds me of the weather we had in the early 80s. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. I remember in the 80s, this is around Bixby. Uh, we had we had windstorms that would come up and they, they, they'd pick up just huge clouds of dust. I mean, during during the during during the, the this the spring months all around Bixby is, is 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 pretty much farming country and so this period of time everybody's got the ground scratched up there's nothing on on the ground for the most part nobody's cover cropping which is a bit disturbing and the skies would be red from the dust or yellow from the dust just depends upon your flavor which direction the the wind was coming from you know, it was. If it was coming from if it was coming from red clay care territory, it's red dust. If it's coming from from from, from the yellow, it's, you know, it's, it's it's yellow dust, and the sky would just be blotted out with dust. Yep. Who knows? We may have those days come back again. All righty. So, hopefully, everybody out there managed to get through your particular storms okay. And if you did suffer some damage, remember, it's not the end of the world. You can recover somehow. <laughs> it may be an opportunity to try different things, like we're getting ready to do. We're not going to try different things in, in terms of we're not going to grow corn anymore. We're just going to try different things as in the way we plant it and the way we grow it. So look for that coming up. I am getting ready to go to bed because it is late and my eyes are getting heavy. And I ran out of coffee a long time ago and I'm almost out of out of tang. And I got work to do tomorrow and all that good stuff. So thank you very much for joining me tonight. Uh, I hope to see you again later on this week or next week. Or so uh, We've got another video coming up and I don't know which one it's going to be. I don't know which one I'm going to do yet. I, 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 I'm, I'm kind of tempted to do one of three different videos and it's three different things that I've got to get done. So you'll get to see one of them and, and then maybe I'll put the others into a, in, 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 in a reserve and show them to you later. We've got three big things coming up, which is uh, the completion of uh, capturing uh, strawberries and propagating strawberries got that. I started it. We're going to go ahead and finish it up. They're done. They're ready to be moved now. Um, we've got that. And what else do I have to do? Softwood cuttings of mulberry and hazelnut. And maybe some other stuff. Possibly uh, possibly I'll try gumi again. I haven't had any luck with gumi cuttings, but I, I, I'm game to try it at least one more time. I've got to get that done. And the reason I've got to get that done, especially with the, the mulberry trees, is it's, it's growing into the power lines. <laughs> Speaking of trouble with power lines, we've got a mulberry tree that's getting up there. So I've, I've, I'm going to have to prune it one way or the other. So I may as well try to get cuttings out. So we've got strawberries. We've got that, that pruning operation going up. And also, uh, I, I, I captured some, 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 some footage of a, a little solitary bee trying to figure out how to build a nest in our wind chime. So we've got coming up with an alternative to building a nest in the wind chime for the for the for the solitary bees and possibly replacement of the wind chime with the wind chime that a solitary solitary bee would not be interested in building a nest in which means a little bit larger wind chime so anyway guys that's all i've got for you tonight as always i hope you found tonight's video informative or entertaining if you did well you know what to do i will catch you next time but until then get out there and get growing Night, everybody.